Savior say, my strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Just died my soul to save, 
Hey, everybody joining us tonight. We're glad you tuned in. And uh, we're continuing our study in the epistle or the letter uh, to the churches of Galatia, written by the Apostle Paul. And before we get, begin tonight, let's say a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for uh, your word, your counsel, uh, your spirit moving amongst us, Lord, as we listen and pay attention, Lord, to your word. It guides us, it strengthens us, it gives us courage, Lord, as we do ministry, as we follow Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you give us an insight into your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this letter to the Galatian churches has been described as Paul's manifesto uh, on the absolute necessity of standing in liberty as a Christian. His glorious defense of the gospel of grace, proclaiming to modern generations that salvation from the penalty and the power of sin comes not from works, uh, but by grace through faith alone in God's provision, Jesus Christ. So we're studying in Galatians chapter 4, and uh, we're looking at verses 8 through 10, and we will be uh, mentioning verses also in the book of Acts. And so, uh, reading Galatians chapter 4, 8, 9, and 10, it, it reads this way. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, and that's in verse 4, but let me drop down to verse 8. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are no gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it uh, that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Verse 10 says, you observe days, months, seasons, and years. Therein lies the problem. In uh, verse 9, uh, how is it that you're turning back, turning again to these weak and beggarly elements, you as a Christian? And so I can relate a little bit to the Apostle Paul uh, and his journeys and the struggles that he had with the peoples in that region. Uh, I had the privilege uh, along with my wife a few months ago, uh, to visit Israel. And uh, what a life-changing two weeks we had. Uh, we observed masses of people with many religions all in the same region. Uh, we walked where Jesus and the apostles walked. It was overwhelmingly awesome just to be in the Holy Land, discovery. It was great. In 2006 also, and in 2008, uh, myself and a missionary team of 12 uh, went to Indonesia uh, to the Balinese people to teach and give dental care to as many people as possible. Again, I observed masses of people with many religions all in the same region. Many role, or my role was to help our dentist by taking blood pressure, for patients, uh, and I did some preaching in city churches uh, and in villages and taught on the radio. I also taught Christian choruses with music and my guitar uh, in English while we were establishing English churches, uh, in English speaking uh, services in a large church in the capital of Jakarta. It was there that I heard for the first time over huge loud speakers uh, the Islam call to prayer at a nearby mosque. I saw for myself all the shrines, these small little uh, square structures. They were everywhere. 
uh, filled with flowers, cigarettes, cookies, rice, fruit on the streets, in front of shops, houses, everywhere, every day. A place where three times a day the locals say thanks to the gods. So in studying our passage, I related to the Apostle Paul's journeys and the obstacles with embedded religious practices in the people he went to reach. Now about these people, the Galatians. It's reported that Julius Caesar uh, said of them, they are fickle, uh, fond of change, and not to be trusted. Amazing. And on this slide, you can see a map of this uh, Galatia region. You see the different cities that are there. Obviously, a lot of traveling to get between places. Uh, sometimes Paul got there via boat and then on foot to different areas. So he, he traveled a lot and got to these various places. So one big observation uh, is that the Apostle Paul devoted three missionary journeys uh, to the Galatia region. The one journey, uh, the first journey actually uh, was in AD 47 to 48. And he continued there teaching the gospel of grace to the very people who once tried to kill him. And you find that in Acts 14 verse 19. That was an amazing thing that Paul had a, a passion as Jesus empowered him to go and spread this good news. The letter to the Galatian churches was written to remedy a desperate situation uh, to call early Christians back from the Mosaic law to grace, from legalism to faith. And so you, you'll see that in verse 9 as, as we look through uh, this section. So clearly God had a purpose and a plan for the peoples of Galatia, and part of that plan began with Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul uh, with his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And as we know uh, from Acts 9, uh, Saul, he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He desired to bring them bound to Jerusalem. And then what happens was a shining light uh, falling and he fell to the ground and later hearing Jesus through Ananias instructing him of his new mission. He said, go for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name uh, before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. Uh, Acts chapter 9 also tells us that Ananias laid his hands on Paul, saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then Paul was baptized. After spending some time with the disciples there at Damascus uh, in Acts 9 verse 20, uh, note that immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So in Galatians 1, 11 through 14, let's go there for a moment and um, we'll read that passage. Paul writes, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel uh, which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor I was taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So in verse 13, we learn of Saul's conduct in Judaism and that he advanced in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries, being more exceedingly zealous 
for the traditions of my fathers. So question, what is Judaism all about? Well, Judaism was marked by a monotheistic religion developed among the ancient Hebrews. Judaism is characterized by a belief in one transcendent God who revealed himself to Abraham, Moses, and the Hebrew prophets, and by a religious life in accordance with scriptures and rabbinic traditions. Judaism, Judaism is the complex phenomena of a total way of life for the Jewish people, comprising theology, law, and, and innumerable cultural traditions. So at Paul's conversion, an amazing transformation took place. He experienced the grace of God, then began to lead the charge, spreading the good news of God's grace through his doctoral instruction writings and his journeys in the region. So as Paul and Barnabas journeyed into Iconium, they went together to a synagogue and spoke where a great multitude of Jews and Greeks believed. But the city was divided. Part sided, or part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laconia, and to the surrounding region. And also in this area, according to Acts 14, some of the Galatians, in their ignorance of the one true God, were in pagan bondage to false gods. At the city of Lystra, a cripple since birth was healed when Paul perceived that the man had faith to be healed, said <coughs> with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. And the people there said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Zeus, and they called Paul Hermes. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Whoa, what's going on here? So in the early church, as the separation between Judaism and Christianity was taking place, the letter to the Galatians, no doubt, help clarify this difference. So in uh, Galatians 1, 6, and 7, we read this. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from, from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So in these passages right here, we got a picture of what was happening during this time as churches are being established. Here are three things Paul considered as real threats. One, there were some who troubled you. Two, there were some who wanted to pervert the gospel of Christ. And three, there was a potential turning away from him who called you in the grace of Christ. These things were Judaism in action by Judaizers who were Christians who teach it necessary to adopt Jewish customs and practices, especially those found in the law of Moses to be saved. To be saved. In Galatians 1.8, uh, we read, Paul saying here, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So the apostle Paul answers these threats by making a strong doctrinal stand 
But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach another gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That is strong, an answer to that threat by the Judaizers. Now, let's describe the problem as we work our way again to the main text. So Acts 15, 1 gives us this picture. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Whoa, what just happened? You see what these people, folks, these Judaizers are teaching the church. Galatians 2, 4, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 uh, speaks to this problem. It says, false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage in whom or to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the fruit of the gospel might continue with you. Notice these teachers were identified as false brethren, secretly brought in by stealth to spy out our liberty in Christ Jesus. The purpose was that they might bring us into bondage. So my commentary on that part of it is reading these scriptures in Acts and Galatians gives you the the pieces here. And while I was going over this, (coughs) uh, I could see that Paul thinking about how the hearers were responding to these Judaizers and then wondering, do you Galatians understand what's happening here? These Judaizers in Galatia, they both discredited Paul and proclaimed a false gospel. So reading Galatians 4, starting at verse 4, let's uh, get a, an idea of what more is happening here. Uh, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, for to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Here we see a transition from slave to, to son and being a son we have our new identity in christ verse 7 says therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir of god through christ and here's the point of the passage in our study but now how is it that you turn again, in verse 9 it says, after you have known God, to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire to be in bondage. How is it? He's very bold here. Why? So the, under the influence of these Judaizers, the Galatians at the very least have begun to observe the Mosaic calendar. Contrasting the liberty that they knew that they found with the bondage of the law, and that is where chapter 4, verse 8 through 10 comes in. And it says, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? 
you observe days and months and seasons and years. These Galatians were turning to refers to the rites and the ceremonies such as found in Judaism, the system of Judaism, with the potential of bringing them into bondage. They observe days, which means like the Sabbath, uh, months, which means like the new moons, seasons means like festivals, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, Years means sabbatical years like jubilees. These weak and beggarly elements mean weak is powerless to save the soul or justify the sinner. Beggarly is or means unable to impart true spiritual riches. Elements means rudimentary, fundamentally. All these were ordinances designed to be replaced with a more spiritual form of worship. If you want to look that up, it's in John 4, 20 through 24. They're designed to replace with a more spiritual form of worship. And that's what you'll see in John there. So the Galatians had come to know, and this word gnosko literally means to know intimately and on a personal level, the true God. They knew the true God. The Galatians were turning back. Paul was amazed and dismayed. Did they understand that they would be going back to religious slavery? This was a big deal. Why would they be attracted to a system that was weak? It couldn't justify or energize for godly living. And it could not provide an inheritance. The principles of that system are of the world, as Paul said in verse 3. You get the sense of Paul's concern in further in verse 11, as it says, I'm afraid for you, lest I labor for you in vain. And so why would you or I return to the life before Christ? It's a great question. Why would I? And so this passage is clearly a personal appeal not to return to legalism and bondage. And in closing for tonight, uh, I myself, I've responded to this appeal. I decided to follow Jesus. And as the song says, no turning back, no turning back. I believe this letter to the Galatians was written to remedy my desperate situation. To call me from my disbelief, my bondage to a world system, to faith in a glorious and forgiving Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that is grace. And so tonight or today, what can I praise God for? My identity and your identity is now in Christ. And as a result of being in Christ, I now am a son. I belong to God. That's so important that I know that I belong. I am known by God, my believing, my faith in Christ, sacrifice for my sin has been accounted to me for righteousness. And then what can we put into practice? Well, a lifestyle now lived by the power of the Holy Spirit, which results not in the works of the flesh, but now in the fruit of the Spirit. And so how can I pray concerning this? It would look like this. God, help me as I turn away from the carnal ways I practiced when I didn't know you. Help me to turn towards you and follow Jesus. So let's pray tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for our study as we looked um, into a controversy that was happening uh, in the region of Galatia where Paul went to share the good news. 
You know, Lord, that he, also, he once was trying to destroy the church, but you chose him, you picked him to share this good news with the same people that tried to kill him. So, Lord, he was invested. He loved the people there. He spent time with them. And, Lord, he desired to see them turn from the ways of the past toward your ways and your will. And so, Father, may that be our prayer, Lord, as we turn from the works of the flesh that don't glorify you to your will and your ways. Guide us, Lord. Thank you for your scripture. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.